How's everybody doing? Good? I missed you, Hope. I was gone for four whole weeks. I hadn't preached in five whole weekends. I missed you. Some of you are like, I didn't even know you left. If that's you, that means you haven't been to church in five weeks. So let me take the opportunity to welcome you back. Uh, We actually meet here every Sunday. You're free to join us. Uh, But I want to say a big thank you to our guests that came and opened up God's word. They're not guests anymore. They're friends. So thank you to Jim. Uh, Thank you to Leonce. Thank you to Albert. Um, These are people that love Jesus and love his church on the stage and off the stage. Let's just thank them for that. Uh, They see God doing something special here in our ministry, and we see God doing something special through them. So it's great to have partners in the Big C, capital C Church all across the country. But this week, you got me again, sorry about that, but we're kicking off a brand new sermon series that we're calling Battle Cry. And that'll make sense in a few minutes, but I wanna kick off uh, this sermon with one question. It's kind of a weird question, but I wanna see uh, how many of you in the room or online or at one of our physical campuses have ever been in a fight before. Go ahead and raise your hand. Not like an online spat or like an argument, like a fist fight, like bows were thrown, fists were flying, raise your hand. Oh, I love our church. That's like 80% of you. <laughs> if this is your first weekend, hey, welcome to Hope. Uh, how many of you have won a fight before? Raise your hand. Okay, good. You're proud of that. Here's a, a trickier question. Are you brave enough to admit if you've ever lost a fight? Go ahead and raise your hand. Okay, okay. Well, I've actually gotten in a, a few fights in my day. I'm not contoning it, contoning it, but uh, the very first fight I ever had was in kindergarten on the bus. So as soon as they let me out of the house, I was fighting. And uh, there was this older girl that had a necklace that I wanted, apparently. I was going through a jewelry phase or something. So I took it, and uh, she, who was uh, a lot older than me and larger, she took it back along with my pride, and I lost that fight. Uh, But that wasn't the last fight that I had. I was pretty scrappy. I actually got suspended for fighting in fourth and sixth and seventh grade. I actually got suspended also in 8th, ninth, and 10th for other things, but that's a different sermon. But some of those fights I won, uh, some of them I lost. Most of them were just like schoolyard brawls, right? Someone throws a punch, the other person throws a punch, a, a teacher jumps in and it's over kind of before it begins. But there's one time where I absolutely got destroyed. There is one time where I just uh, tasted what defeat really, really tastes like. And... Uh, it was, it was the evening that I tested for my black belt in Taekwondo. That's right. I'm a black belt in Taekwondo. You guys didn't realize that. Yeah. I don't know how legit it was because I'm like 12 years old when I got it. But um, just know that when you critique me after the service in the atrium, I'm holding back. I'm like, oh, you don't like that sermon point, Roger? Well, how do you like this roundhouse to the face? I would never do that. I'm no longer flexible enough. But um, in order to get my black belt, I had to run a mile and under a certain time period, I had to show all my forms, like my weapon forms and stuff. I had to show that I could defend myself against a knife and a gun. And then the last part, not a real gun, it was a wooden one. And then uh, I had to walk the line. And it sounds spooky, doesn't it? Walk the line. It's because it was. My teacher had invited the high, highest level black belts at that school to join him that evening. So there were five or six of them. And I had to fight every single one of them in a row. And I had to fight them until each one decided that, yes, I could defend myself. Or if I couldn't defend myself, I would keep getting back up. Like we could hit him down, but he's going to keep getting back up. And these weren't like 16-year-old black belts. These were grown dudes. So imagine me, a 12-year-old, going toe-to-toe with like a 43-year-old man getting off the second shift at like the paper mill down the road. And these are the dudes that I have to fight. And I got, I got clobbered. I got punched in the face. I got uh, punched in the throat. I got the wind kicked out of me. There was one guy that literally held me above his head and tossed me on the mat multiple times. So I went through those fights four or five times in a row until the last guy finally bowed me out. And my teacher said, well done. And he presented me with the belt. I kind of wiped the blood off my nose and accepted that. And that was a good moment. And I remember that moment, but I remember even more the morning after. (laughs) When I opened my eyes and I had a black eye and I had bruises and I'm like, oh, this is what it feels like to get beat up. And I actually stayed home from school because I was so beat up I couldn't even go. And I remember having this thought like, okay, I accomplished what I wanted to accomplish. I got the belt, but why does it hurt so bad? (laughs) Like I got the belt, but I got some serious bruises as well. And I think of that morning sometimes when I feel that same way spiritually that I felt physically that morning. You ever feel just defeated 
spiritually? Like when it comes to your spiritual walk, you ever just wake up in the morning and feel beat up? Like, yeah, I got the belt, but man, why does it hurt so much? Like, yeah, I got forgiveness. And yeah, I have eternity in heaven. But the abundant life that Jesus promised, I'm not feeling that so much right now. Feels like I'm just taking punch after punch after punch from the enemy. And it just feels like some days the deck is stacked against you spiritually. Anybody feel like that? Is that just me? I feel like that sometimes. Well, if you've ever felt that way, like you were just in the midst of a battle that seems unfair, the reason that you feel that way is because you are. The Bible says that if you're a Christ follower, I'm at war, you're at war. That's why you feel that way. If you're a Christ follower, you are in the midst of a battle every single moment of every single day. And the Bible says that we're not just going against one enemy and we're not even just going against two enemies, but we are up against three enemies, three powerful enemies that are gunning for us. The Bible calls it the world, the flesh, and the devil. Listen, online at all of our campuses, if you can hear my voice right now, you have an enemy and his name is Satan and he hates you. And he hates your family and he hates uh, what you could do in God's kingdom, your potential. And the reason he hates you is because what he really wants is to rule over God. His deepest desire is to have God bow down to him. And he knows that he can't have that. He can never have that. So he takes out all of his anger and all of his rage on the people that God loves, which is you and it's me. And so right now, if you're a Christ follower, Satan is trying to do one of two things. Either one, he's trying to get you to believe that he is strong and you are weak. That any battle you enter into against him, it is a losing battle. Or he's going to try to convince you that there is no battle. That it's a peacetime right now. He's going to try to get to lull you to sleep and to stop you from putting a flag in the ground and making a stand and living intentionally. He wants you to just go with the current of the world, which is our second enemy, the world. The world in the Bible is the system of false beliefs uh, that Satan has gotten the people in our culture to believe. It's the popular beliefs of our day, the, the half-truths that try to pull us away from God. And as if that weren't enough, we also have the flesh. And we're going to talk about this in a few weeks. But the flesh, the Bible says, it's not an outside enemy. This is an enemy that resides within. And the flesh is kind of like you, but it's not the real you. It's the old you. It's the, it's the you that used to hate God. It's that constant voice that you hear day after day. Hey, don't, don't trust him. You don't have to obey that. God's ways don't lead to contentment. God's ways don't lead to joy. It's that constant companion pulling you away from God. So even if, if Satan is not gunning for you or the, the cultural pressure isn't, you still have that fight against the flesh. And when you add all this up, I mean, it seems like an impossible battle, doesn't it? I mean, it's one of you and it's three of them. Three powerful enemies, enemies that we have seen defeat Christians all around us. I mean, we've all seen a brother or sister in Christ fall into something like adultery or drugs or theft or alcoholism or pride or cover-ups or lies. I mean, it seems like not a month goes by where a hero of the faith doesn't fall. And because of all of this, many of us are tempted to give up the fight before it's even begun. We just assume that we're going to lose before we even take a stand. We say things like, my dad was an alcoholic, so was his dad, so was his dad. There's no hope for me. We say things like, you know, my, my mom was a bad mom because she had a bad mom, so I'm obviously going to be a bad mom. I can't break that cycle. Or that super Christian with a worldwide ministry, they fell. How am I going to get through this? Or I've dealt with this addiction or this habit or this hang-up my entire life. There's no changing me now. And so many Christians seem content to just settle for limping through our Christian walk, just taking the punches as they come and giving up hope of ever fighting back. You ever feel that way? Like when it comes to, to this habit or to this cycle or this broken marriage or this wreck of a family, I guess this is just as good as it will ever get. That reminds me of a guy in Scripture. It's in Acts chapter 3. If you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn there. You can use your cell phones as well. If you don't know, Acts is the second book that a guy named Luke wrote. The first is the Gospel of Luke. It's about Jesus and uh, his ministry. Acts records the birth or the beginning of the early church after Jesus ascends to the Father after his resurrection and sits at the Father's right hand. The church is birthed, and this happens very, very early in the book. But it's an amazing story. It says this, Peter and John went to the temple one afternoon to take part in the 3 o'clock prayer service. 
And as they approached the temple, a man lame or paralyzed from birth was being carried in. Each day he was put beside the temple gate and the, the one called the beautiful gate so he could beg from the temple, from those going into the temple. He was lame from birth, broken since birth, paralyzed since birth. I, I identify with this guy. I don't know if you've come face to face with your sin like I have, but I, I've thought to myself hundreds of times, Chase, why are you so messed up? And it's not just the stuff that I do, it's the messed up person inside that makes me do that stuff, right? It's like when I was born, I fell out of the century and like hit every branch on the way down. Like addiction, I got that. Secrecy, hiding, yeah, I got some of that. Laziness, I got some of that. Anger, yeah. Pride, some days. Self-pity, selfishness, like you name it, and there's probably a little bit of it inside of me. And I think we're all like that. It's what the Bible calls sin. It's our high propensity to mess things up, right? We all have that sin. We're all born lame, spiritually speaking. So that was this guy. He was physically what we are spiritually. He had to, he had to rely on other people's help his entire life. He was unable to walk and unable to change that, so he just accepted it. He just assumed this is who I am. This is who I will always be. I am the lame man. I'm the broken man. I'm the one who sits out and begs. And he didn't entertain any dreams of ever changing. You can tell that by what he requests from Peter and from John. It says this, when he saw Peter and John about to enter, he asked them for some what? Some money, right? He had heard about Peter and John before. These are influential men that had walked with Jesus. He certainly had heard about Jesus. And so when he encounters these men, unlike any other men he's ever known, and he gets the opportunity to ask for whatever he wants, what is he asking for? For some spare change, for just a little bit of change. He didn't ask him for a wheelchair. He didn't ask them to pray for him. He didn't ask them to heal him, certainly. He didn't dream that that could ever be possible. He just wanted a little bit of change. Just enough to get him through the day and forget about all the days that come after. And that's us. That's us. I hear people say all the time, listen, I, I don't think you understand. I'm an angry person. That's who I am. That's who I'll always be. I'll never become a calm person. But if, if I can just have just one eruption every single month, I'd settle for that. I'd be okay with that. Or I've heard I've always been an addict, and I always will be. I just need to keep it under control. I need just enough change to keep my job, maybe my marriage, maybe my kids. Just make it to the end of the week without losing too much. That, that's the goal. I've always been blank. You fill in the blank. And I'll never be any different. The best I can hope for is to, to manage it to hide it from other people, to cope with it, to not let it get out of hand. The best I can hope for is a little bit of change. That was this guy. But see, this guy had no idea what God had in store to him, with, for him. It says in verse 4, Peter and John looked at him intently, like they stare at him. And they look back and they're like, does he know who we, does he know who Jesus, no? And, and Peter says, look at us. So the, main, uh, the lame man looked at them eagerly expecting some money, but Peter said, I don't have any silver or gold for you. He says, I don't have any spare change. I don't have on offer momentary fixes or half measures. And those of you that are broken listening right now, those of you that are stuck, those of you that can't escape the cycle that you've been in maybe for decades, you need to hear that that's what God is saying to you today as well. God's saying, I don't have any small change. My goal was never to make you into a little bit better version of the person that you are. My goal was never to turn you into someone a little bit less messed up, a little bit less broken. God says, I don't have that to offer you. I got something else, and it's all that I can give. Peter says, but I'll give you what I have. In the name of Jesus Christ, the Nazarene, get up and walk. Then Peter took the lame man by the right hand, underline that, he took the man by the right hand and helped him up. And as he did, the man's feet and ankles were instantly healed and strengthened. And he jumped up and he stood on his feet and he began to walk. But not just walk, it says, then walking, leaping and praising God, he went into the temple with them. Listen, that's what God has on offer. He doesn't have just a little bit of spare change, but complete change. What God wants to offer you is a 100% transformation, 180 degree reversal. That's because God doesn't deal in small change, but new creation, right? 
The type of change where it's not just you that notices a little bit of traction here and there, but the type of transformation where everyone in your life said, what in the world has happened to them? They're a different person. It says this, all the people saw him walking and heard him praising God. When they realized he was the lame beggar they had seen so often at the beautiful gate, they were absolutely astounded. Listen, God wants to work in you the type of change where people say, isn't that the alcoholic? That we see crying over a beer every Friday night at the bar. Look at him. He's, he's sober. He's happy. He's healthy. What in the world happened to him? God wants to work the type of change in you where your kids go, man, mommy's not angry anymore. She seems to be at peace. She seems to be a different person. What in the world has happened to them? That's the type of change that God wants for you. The problem is a lot of us haven't even dreamed that that's a possibility. I'll have a lot of young men come into my office, and I know what they struggle with before they even say it. 99% of the time it's pornography. And so I'll work with them and I'll talk with them. And one of the things I love to do is I get to introduce them to a friend of mine who's in his 60s who really struggled with that in his early 20s but has been free, completely free for 30-plus years. And their eyes are just like, I didn't even know that was possible. I know people that were deep into alcoholism, and when they met Jesus overnight, they have been completely free from that for decades. That's the type of transformation that God wants for you. The question is, why don't more of us experience it? Why don't more of us walk in the abundant life that Jesus came to bring us? Well, that's what this series is about. I want to show you one little detail in this text that might explain why, and it's what this series is all about. It's a small detail. I actually thought... I was reading into the text when I saw it a few years ago, and I thought I was making a mountain out of a molehill, but then I started to look at this theme throughout the Old Testament and the New Testament, and some commentaries started me to back me up. So you're going to laugh or be confused when I tell you what it is, but stick with me. It's this one little detail that Luke includes, and I ask you to underline it. It says that when Peter healed this man, it took him by, he took him by the right hand in order to hoist him into his new life. Uh, this term, right hand, if you read Luke a lot or the Gospels or, or the, the book of Acts, you'll realize very quickly that Luke is extremely intentional. He doesn't waste words. He's very, very intentional about the progression of events and about the details that he includes. If you actually do a, a Bible search on any online commentary, you'll find that that term right hand happens about 120 times in the Old Testament and about 40 times in the New Testament. And so it's a very common metaphor that the Bible uses for two things, for power and for authority. For power and for authority. It says this in Exodus, your right hand, O Lord, is glorious in power. Your right hand, O Lord, smashes the enemy. Uh, Deuteronomy says, the Lord came from Mount Sinai and dawned upon us with flaming fire in his right hand. Uh, when fathers would bless their sons in the Old Testament, they would, bless, they would place their right hand upon their heads, almost transferring the authority and position that they had as the man of the house to the one that would become their heir. And there's lots more of examples we could see in the Old Testament, but you flip to the New Testament and you see it as well. Where did Jesus go after he ascended back into heaven? Where is he seated? At the Father's right hand. Jesus says himself, but from now on, the Son of Man will be seated in the place of power at God's right hand. And what we see is that it's by that power, that position, that authority that Jesus transformed this man's life. Peter says it. The, the crowds are so amazed. They're like, how is this possible? Peter says, don't be surprised. Uh, through faith in the name of Jesus, this man was healed. And you know how crippled he was before. Faith in Jesus' name or position of power and authority that has healed him before your very eyes. So what happened in this miracle was not that Jesus looked down on this paralyzed man and just kind of sped up the healing process or injected him with like anti-paralysis drug that wasn't invented yet. What happened was that Jesus, through Peter and John, looked at this lame man where that paralysis had had authority over him all, ever since he was born, and Jesus said, hey, paralysis, I know you've kind of been in charge, but there's a new king on the throne, and it's me. <laughs> you see the crowd? And he said, by the power invested in me, I command you by my authority to leave, and the disease said, yes, sir, and it left. See? And incidentally, this wasn't the first time that Peter had used the authority of Jesus to heal and transform lives. 
Look at this story in Luke 9. It's a weird story, but it's in the Bible. It says, one day Jesus called together his 12 disciples. Later we realize it's about 72. And he gave them, gifted them, power and authority to cast out all demons and to heal all diseases. Then he sent them out to tell everyone about the kingdom of God and to heal the sick. And so that's what they did. And son of a gun, it worked. (laughs) And they come back and look what happens. It said, when the 72 disciples returned, they joyfully reported to him, Lord, even demons obey us when we use your name. And Jesus said, yeah, that shouldn't be surprising. I saw Satan fall from heaven like lightning. Look, I have given you authority over all the power of the enemy. And you can walk among snakes and scorpions and crush them. Nothing will injure you. But don't rejoice just because a few evil spirits obey you. Rejoice that your name is registered in heaven. See, this is the power and authority of Jesus. And you should know that the power and authority that Jesus gave to the disciples, it's available to you as well. You just might not have ever heard about it. Or you've heard about it and it was someone weird that was teaching that was asking for your money from the TV, right? But that's what this sermon series is all about, unleashing the power and authority of Jesus in your life. Let me give you a little history lesson and some verses to back this up. There was a time where human beings had power and authority. It was when we were first created. If you read in Genesis chapter 1, when God created man, it said, let us create man in our image, in our image he created them. And then he said, let them have what? Dominion over everything over the fish and the, over, over spiritual things and physical things. Now, God had the ultimate authority, but as Adam and Eve submitted to him, they were like his prince and princess on earth, and what they said went. Now, that lasted for about, I don't know, 20 seconds, because <laughs> in Genesis chapter 3, Adam gave that authority away to Satan. See, Satan had tried to get God's own authority away from him. He had tried to dethrone God and take the throne of heaven. And when that didn't work and he was cast out of heaven down to earth, well, he said, well, let's try this again. He sought more authority. Well, how do you do that? Well, you go after the one that's on the throne and you dethrone them, Adam and Eve. And so that's what he did. And what we know about Adam is that he didn't have to give that authority away. The moment the serpent started talking and getting him to doubt God, Adam could have said, get out of the garden, and Satan would have had to obey because he has dominion over the things that creep on the earth and over the fish and over the animals. But instead, he entertains this false promise. He rebels against God, and in that moment, he just gave that authority away to Satan. In that moment, Satan was legally given Adam's authority by Adam himself. And what Satan had failed to achieve in heaven, he momentarily achieved on earth. And you see this in the New Testament, weird verses like in Ephesians, uh, Paul calls uh, Satan the prince of the power of this world. Or uh, when Jesus is tempting, when Satan is tempting Jesus in the wilderness, um, he shows them all the kingdoms of the earth. And then he says this, to you I will give all of this, what? Authority and their glory for it's been delivered to me and I give it to whom I will. If you then will worship me, it will all be yours. He thought it was ultimate authority. It wasn't. But see, God wouldn't allow this to continue forever. So he enacted this plan to take back the authority that Adam had given up. And he had to do it legally. So if through one man that authority was given up, through another man it would be regained. That's why Jesus was born fully God and fully man. And he was tempted by Satan just like Adam to give up his authority, but he refused to do it. When he died, he paid the penalty for our rebellion. And then when he rose from the grave, what keys was he carrying with him? The keys to the kingdom, right? He won back the authority that Adam had lost. Hebrews puts it this way. Because God's children are human beings made out of flesh and blood, the son also became flesh and blood. For only as a human uh, being could he die. And only by dying could he break the power of the devil who had the power of death. Only in this way could he set free all those who have lived their lives as slaves um, to the fear of dying. Or Colossians says this, he canceled the record of the charges against us and took it away by nailing it to the cross. In this way he disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by his victory over them on the cross. See, Jesus won back that authority that we had lost, and through him, it's available to us once more, but not completely. Not completely. 
Some of your heresy detectors were going off like the past few minutes, okay? We, we have spiritual authority, but we don't have physical authority. Hebrews puts it this way. Now, in putting everything in subjection to Jesus, he left nothing outside his control, but at present we do not yet see everything in subjection to him. That's a, that's a whole other sermon. But when it comes to us, the Bible clearly says we have authority over evil powers. When it comes to the world, the flesh, and the devil, they have absolutely no power or authority over you. We have the authority there, but we don't have authority over physical things like cancer cells or diseases or mudslides. Some would argue with me. I don't think we do. One day we will, but not yet. But until that day, we do have spiritual, a spiritual authority and power of Jesus at our disposal if we'll just learn how to use it. And we're going to go into greater depth in the coming weeks, but for now, just for this week, here's all you need to think about. Here's the truth. Here's what I need you to believe because it's true. When it comes to that one battle that you have been fighting over and over and over and over again, when it comes to that battle with addiction or your spouse or that, that toxic relationship or a habit or a hang-up or a spouse, that battle that you have lost over and over and over again, listen, you already have victory in Jesus. Victory has already been secured through his power and his authority in your life. The problem is Satan doesn't want you to know that. It's like after the Civil War. Um, when the proclamation was made that all the slaves were free, there were many southern slave owners that, that told their slaves otherwise. That said, that's not true. That's a lie. You're still my property. You still belong to me. But they weren't. Right? They, they still got them to act that way. But the slaves legally could have walked to their freedom. And officially, legally, that slave owner could have done nothing about it. And it's the same with you. The world and the flesh and the devil has absolutely no authority over you anymore. It might feel like it does, but it doesn't. God's word says, so now there is no condemnation for those who belong to Christ Jesus. And because you belong to him, listen, the power of the life-giving spirit has freed you from the power of sin that leads to death. Later he says, sin is no longer your master. For you no longer live under the requirements of the law. Instead, you live under the freedom of God's grace. In Colossians, it says that God has rescued us from the kingdom of darkness and transferred us into the kingdom of his dear son who purchased our freedom and forgave our sins. Listen, some of you feel like you are trapped in a cage. And maybe it's been a year, maybe it's been five, maybe it's been decades. But what you need to know today is that it might feel like you're in a cage, but through Jesus, the door has been unlocked and it stands ready for you to walk out. Some of you feel as if you've been in bondage for years and decades. Some, something's chaining you to your past or to a habit, to a cycle. And what you need to know is that those chains have fallen off in and through Jesus. Some of you are so tired of fighting battle after battle after battle and facing defeat after defeat after defeat. But what you need to know is that any battle you fight as a Christ follower is fought on conquered ground. And this isn't pop psychology. This isn't wishful thinking. This is what God does. God is in the business of breaking the power of sin in people's lives and releasing them, freeing them to be the people that God has created them to be. You don't have to settle. You don't have to be anything less than God has created you to be. And we see him do this all the time. We see him take a coward like Gideon and turn him into a mighty warrior, right? We see him take a shy, young Jewish girl named Esther and turn her into a bold, courageous woman of God that goes against kings and kingdoms and changes the lives of generations of Jewish people. We see him take this murderous guy named Saul and humble him and empower him to change the world. And if he can do that with them, I want you to be bold enough to believe he can do that in your life as well. So here's what I want you to do right now. I want you to think right now of that one area of your life where you are just living in constant defeat. That one sin, that one cycle, that hidden habit, that one battle that you just can't seem to win. And I want you to do something brave. I want you to name it. You don't have to say it out loud if you don't want to. You can whisper it or say it under your breath online across all of our campuses. But I want you to put words to what that area is right now. If it's pride, say it. If it's lust, name it. If it's an eating disorder, 
if it's a gambling addiction, if it's a drinking problem, an anger problem, a wound that just refuses to heal or a fear that just paralyzes you, I want you to name it and say it out loud. That area that you just named, that you just thought of, listen, that's the area that Satan has gotten you to believe that you're powerless. It's the area where you've believed that, that, that he is strong and you are weak. He's gotten you to believe that that's a battle that you will never, ever win. Can I just tell you? Those things that Satan says to you, those are lies. They are lies from the pit of hell. It's not true. You don't have to stay where you are. You can change. You can heal. You can overcome. You want to hear the truth from God's word? And I pray that this replaces all the lies that you've been believing. Here's the truth. God's word says, the Lord will march forth like a mighty hero. He will come out like a warrior full of fury. He will shout his battle cry and crush all of his enemies. And if something's gunning for you, you better believe that's God's enemy. For who is God except the Lord? Who but your God is a solid rock? God arms you with strength. That's true. He makes your way perfect. He trains your hands for battle. He strengthens your arm to draw a bronze bow. He has given you his shield of victory. That's true. His right hand supports you. His help has made you great. He has made a wide path for your feet to keep them from slipping. He has armed you with strength for the battle. That's true. So in response to this hope, those of you that feel broken, those of you that feel stuck, those of you that just know the taste of defeat, take a new grip with your tired hands and strengthen your weak knees. Mark out a straight path for your feet so that those who are weak and lame Right? Like our man in the story, broken, will not fall, but become strong. That's true. See, God has already shouted his battle cry. He's already rallied the troops. And so I want to give us a chance to do the same. This is going to be weird for some of y'all. Some of y'all are going to love this. But every single week, we're going to make our own declaration. We're going to make our own rally cry. We're going to make a series of statements, resolutions that we're going to say out loud together. It's a list of commitments that we are going to commit to together. You don't have to commit, but if you really mean it, if you really want to change, then I encourage you to make these commitments. Uh, you should have received a card and a pen as you walked in. Go ahead and get that out across all of our campuses online. Uh, we're going to send you a link to a digital copy. But week after week, uh, we're going to write down in our own handwriting a declaration, a battle cry of sorts. And what I'd encourage you to do is I'd encourage you to put these, that card somewhere where you can see it. Maybe it's on your bathroom mirror. Uh, maybe it's on your car radio. Maybe you take a picture of it and it's the wallpaper on your cell phone, wherever it is, so that you can see it over and over again so that when the going gets tough and the enemy's trying to drag you down, you'll be reminded of the strength and the power that you have in God. So the battle cry for this week is this. It's really simple. It already says I will, but the battle cry for this week is I will refuse to be anything less than who God has created me to be. I will refuse to be anything less than who God has created me to be. So if you wanna make that commitment, if you wanna make that battle cry, go ahead and write that down. Across all of our campuses, write that down in the first open page you have. I will refuse to be anything less than the person that God has created me to be. I'm done being stuck. I'm through settling. I want to chase after what God has put in front of me. I refuse to be anything less than who God has created me to be. Do you write it down? Now, I wanna ask if you're willing to not just write it down, but to believe that that is possible. Is there anyone here that wants to take Jesus at his word and stop living in defeat? To believe that the battle can finally be won? Is there anyone that's willing to join the heroes of the faith that we read about in the Bible that refuse to lay down or to settle or to give up, but instead stand up and fight? Anyone here? I want to ask you to stand up if you're willing to believe that. Stand up across all of our campuses. Where are my warriors at? Where are my fighters at? This is awesome. God's going to do some amazing things in the coming weeks. Well, let's make that declaration together. Right? I will refuse to be anything less than who God has created me to be. Let's say it out loud if you mean it. If you want to commit, let's say it together. I will refuse to be anything less than who God has created me to be. Say it again. I will refuse to be anything less than who God has created me to be. One more time. I will refuse to be anything less than who God has created me to be. Father, I pray that we experience that reality, Father. I pray for transformation. I pray for people to walk out of cells, for bonds to be broken. 
for, for histories to literally change. And I, I pray for the type of transformation that's not just for an individual, but that sins that have been around in our family for generations, it stops with us that our children and our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren are, are blessed, are different because of the commitments and decisions that we make in this series. So Father, would you do this? Would you transform us? Would you empower us? Would you, would you allow us to taste the abundant life that Jesus has come to breathe? And it's, and it's not through our strength, but it's through the power and the authority and the position and the name of Jesus Christ that we pray all of these things. Amen. An almighty fortress, you go before us. Nothing can stand against the power of our God. You shine in the shadow, you win every battle. Nothing can stand against the power. Well, that is a strong message and a strong challenge and a strong statement. So thank you so much, Chase. I will refuse to be anything less than who God has created me to be. We as a church refuse to be anything less than who God has created us to be. That is compelling. That it calls us to action, to be on our knees in prayer and giving of our lives over to something that is not about us. Uh, and that's exciting stuff. One way that we are doing that here at Hope Community Church is through our bumper crop. If you're not familiar with what bumper crop is, it's one way that we stock our shelves for our food pantry. So while you are out and about shopping, filling up your grocery uh, basket with whatever items you have, there's some items that we have that we need on our shelves in our food pantry. You can go to gethope.net slash local hope to see what those items are and then drop those off at any of our campuses. Now, I can't say that without saying this, uh, times are tough. Uh, the cost of groceries is up and gas is up and the need is greater than it was. And that means that we cannot be a church that allows for food insecurity to exist within our walls. That's not the kind of family, we refuse to be a family that allows that to happen. So if you have a need, check out gethope.net slash food pantry, and it's all the information there. If your social network or your community, anybody you know has needs, send them to that website and we'll get them set up. Let's be a church of action. All right. We love you guys. We are so looking forward to this series and we'll see you next week.